Okay, uh, I don't know about you, but if you're from out of town like I am, out of state actually, you're probably <laughs> happy to be here instead of where you're from. And where I'm from is uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, which is down at the tail end of the Great Plains, and right now I think it's 25 degrees with wind chill of about 17 in the little town I'm at, so uh, very glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, Chicago, he's been... Minus 18 of no wind chill. Oh, my. Yeah, I'm Southern California, so it's 10 degrees. Yeah. You know, I, uh, this is this is a winter's day in Corpus. Normally it's about 60 or so and kind of clear with light winds, so this is like hometown weather before we get one of these vortexes, they call it. Mm -hmm. They dump all that stuff down. Anyway, good, uh, good friend of mine, uh, Andrew Malakovic, he's from Bismarck, North Dakota. She teaches at North Dakota State there. And I just, oh, been, oh, poor Andrew. So I sent her a message on Facebook to like, come on down, girl. <laughs> she goes, I wish I could. <laughs> all right, today I'm going to talk about remote access to virtualized technology. Uh, my name is Philip Davis. I'm the program manager of the Spatial Technology Consortium. Huh. That is a round one uh, DOL TAA CCCT grant. Uh, we're a consortium of seven colleges in five uh, five different states. Uh, the college that I'm at, Del Mar College, was tasked with doing the ge geospatial part of that. So on this NIS CTC, we do the GT at the end, the geospatial technology. What I'm going to demonstrate to you today is curriculum that was built, GIS curriculum that was built from the ground up from standards. But I know a lot of you are not, probably no one here teaches GIS at your college, you're all IT security stuff, which we do. And what you'll see here, we've got uh, an equivalent component. Um, it's network security and Cisco and all the stuff that we're building using the same technology and all. So what you see here uh, applies to those other two technologies. It's just that the one that I'm going to give is on GIS. But the methodologies uh, and, the, and the tools and techniques that we did to create the curriculum, I think are, are of general interest to each of you. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll go through the agenda here. Let's see. And what I really like to emphasize is the fact that the curriculum you'll look at was the industry-led process. How we got to that point took uh, about five years and several million dollars worth of NSF and DLL money to get to the point where we could do the curriculum development methodology. So really there's a couple of different uh, projects that were involved here. I'm currently being funded under the NSGTC, which is like it's at round one. My college was the former uh, Geotech Center, which is National Science Foundation Center of Effort. So a lot of the industry-like curriculum process was done under that between 2009 and 2012, which led to the foundation of the stuff that you can see here. Uh, what we've done is we've delivered um, a, an online curriculum, which is available today for download. It's all, it's all based on Creative Commons, so it's free to share and reuse with attribution. Uh, I think it's actually a non-exclusive uh, license is the way it's worded. Um, and so we'll be looking at that. I'll show you a couple of ways that we're doing e-delivery options in terms of our learning management systems. But again, the, the actual curriculum itself is in the raw. If you want to download it from, uh, from one of our GitHub uh, things, you can use it verbatim in there, mix it, reuse it, use as little or as much of it, integrate it with other ones. Uh, and then we'll do a quick remote access demonstration to the virtualized server and talk about the pros and cons of that, and then hopefully do a little bit of a question and answer. Okay. All right, so talk about the industry-led uh, process. Today's two keynotes talked about, and I think Jim Jones, who's real big here at NPIC, really emphasizes industry, right? It's always the first thing out of Jim's mouth is we are industry-led. And Jim, being a non-academic that come from industry, you know, he really appreciates the fact that we ought to, at the technical programs in tutor community colleges, we ought to let industry drive it. I don't necessarily think that we need to be vendor specific, and I've got real issues with that versus open source or, or agnostic. But I think the skills that industry helps us identify are the ones that we should be make, making sure that we're covering and preparing our students for. Um, all the curriculum that you see that you'll see today is based upon what's called the GTCM or uh, Department of Labor Geospatial Technology Competency Model. How many of you are aware of the Competency Model Warehouse at the Department of Labor? The ETA, Employment Training Administration, has. It's, it's a wonderful resource if you're an educator who over the years has tried to develop curriculum, and it's kind of hard to find standards. Um, higher education is unlike secondary in that secondary education has many, many default standards that are more or less mandated to them by the state or by uh, some professional organization, primarily from the state, right? And now we have this statewide effort, the Common Core Curriculum. 
which of course Texas is one of the only couple of states that doesn't even acknowledge <laughs> that, that that thing exists. Anyway, um, we don't normally have that when it comes to uh, when it comes to higher education technical programs. An exception to that would be, of course, uh, would be the Cisco Academy going back 10 or 15 years where Cisco basically built an academy uh, curriculum from the ground up saying these are exactly the skills that are that, that our graduates are going to need to get our certification. So this here is an industry certification. It's an industry standard. It's not a vendor standard. So the people that participate, and I helped put the panel together that created this, panel of 12 experts at the national level, facilitated by the Department of Labor. Uh, facilitator trained in this. Um, the standard is what industry says that we need. Um, the GTCM itself is one of I think 20 or 22 industries that they currently and they're always looking, there's always good grants out there from the Department of Labor to create these things. I know some of the centers involved here, Baytech and a few others, uh, the current center in Dallas, have worked on the IT standards um, that I see out there. What's interesting to me is that even though IT has probably been around longer because I, I consider GIS a subset of IT, geographers would argue and say no, it's a subset of geography, it's really it's a marriage of both, um, is the IT uh, competency model is not yet complete from what I can tell, unlike uh, this one that we started in 2009. The competency model that you're looking at right here, we'll, we'll click on that in just a second and look at it. This, uh, this, the way the Department of Labor does these competency models, they're all basically the same. It's a tiered model in this pyramid. And what's neat was uh, the second keynote today talked about uh, grit. Uh, what we call it in this competency model is gumption. And the word, the, the, the attribute or the, you know, the, the ability to have gumption, that skill set, is something that employers actually identified, several employers that were in this. Uh, this national GTC and palette we put together mentioned that. And I'll show you where it's actually built down in here into one of the core competencies. So if, if you can look at this, it talks about personal effectiveness competencies, academic competencies, and workplace competencies. Every one of the 22 industry that have these uh, curriculum models, these competency models, they're all the same. Then at level four, uh, tier four, I should say, you have what they call industry-wide technical competencies. So these are competencies that industry said everybody in the field should have. Doesn't matter if you're a technician or if you're an expert advanced scientist, you should all have this. Then we divide it into what we call industry sectors. And this is where the bloodletting occurred in our, this is what was holding back our industry from having this competency model complete for almost five years. It's where the Geotech Center came in and kind of was able to negotiate, if you will, uh, these actual position these actual uh, sectors right here. So we have positioning and um, measuring. We have analysis and modeling and software. So those are the three major uh, sectors that we will, that this industry, the geospatial technology industry is divided into. And if you drill down at each one of those like we will in a second, you'll see if there's specific KSAs with that. So as you move up this model right here, what's happening is you're better, more, better defining exactly what it is skills that workers in this industry are supposed to have. So again, the things that we'll see here, you can apply to your IT security, to your network, Cisco, whatever it is, um, looking at that. When you get to tier six and above here, these are what they call occupational standards. And so when we click on one of those, you'll see that it goes out to the ET, ETA website and it looks at specific uh, SOCs, standard occupation codes, and then you can drill down further into that. Uh, over here is what's called management competencies. And we, we in our industry, we're, we, we work with the largest uh, agnostic uh, organization, professional organization called URISA, the Urban Resource Information Systems Administration or Association. They've been around some 50 years. They're an international association, probably 150,000 members in this geospatial technology, and they came up with the what they call the uh, geospatial management competency model, GCMC. Okay, so, and it complemented the technical. But what we do here at the community college, what we do is we're trying to train people from the ground up for that target right there. So if I were to actually go over and click on that, here's the Geotech Center uh, website. Here's a picture of the COMSU model. You could click on that and it would send you here. So this is Career One software run by the ETA. Here's the actual model itself and it's an interactive, it's an interactive graphic. So if I click on any of these right here, it would actually pull up the KSAs for that. At the very bottom, personal effectiveness competencies, isn't what they were calling soft skills? Hopefully they would come into us to the college at tier four, right? K 
tiers one through three would be done while they were growing up under mommy and daddy and the teachers, and they would come to us ready for us to train them the, the, the technical competencies. Mm -hmm. Again, you're hearing that that's not being done and somehow we're supposed to put that in uh, to our curriculum. So you could look at that and notice I can drill down into any one of these. Uh, let's see, creative thinking, workplace competencies. So you can drill down and take a look at that. I can look at industry-wide competencies. And here they talk about the actual uh, content areas of what they're supposed to know. These are the sources that we uh, use to, to get that. So what's wonderful about this thing is if you're a faculty trying to develop curriculum or trying to evaluate your curriculum, get some standard out there, there is now a national standard for the U.S. And this is, by the way, this is being uh, looked at very closely in Europe. I deal a lot with European uh, geospatial educators and also Australia. I've been invited, we've given a presentation down in Canberra, which is the Canberra Institute of Technology, uh, and their national boards, similar to our uh, DOL here, and they're looking at the model that we've done here as sort of a, a leading edge, I think. So this provides you uh, basically a very good outline. And then I can even go down into each of the sectors and notice it gets more and more detailed as you get into there. And then finally at the top I can go to one of the occupations, so this sends me to a slightly different website. And these are the SOCs currently recognized that contain geospatial technology, the top one being information scientists and technology. <coughs> and here you can see quite a bit of, uh, of detail in terms of the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, abilities, and work activities, tools that they should, should, should know for that. So again, if you're trying to create curriculum, I highly, uh, I highly encourage you to go out and look at the model for, for your particular industry, which uh, for most of you would, of course, be uh, information technology right here, right? And you'll see NPIC and uh, the ICT and BATEX logos here. <laughs> What's interesting is notice they've got industry-wide, but again, they don't have their industry sector done yet. So this is where we were in 2009 when we went to the Department of Labor and proposed to them the methodology. So apparently there's probably some political things going on there, you know, is it Microsoft is going to dominate or Oracle or whatever, trying to get those people together so that we can uh, come up with this. All right. We complement this with what's called a BUILT, a Business Industry Leadership Team. So we have the GTCM. The GTCM actually right now is being reviewed and updated as we speak because it was published in uh, June 2010 and so now we're going on 2014 so they figure about over three to five years the technology changes enough. I mean it's not radically changing but you know with UAVs and new me measurements and remote sensing, new standards coming up so the technology changes so it has to be updated. We try to do ours a little more, a little more frequently with basically a nationwide advisory board. So all of your technical programs in your community college probably have a local advisory board, right? We have a national advisory board because this is a national consortium, but it's the same thing. So they look at and they, they advise us on whatever the, the changes and the trends and so forth. Okay, we did, so now you know where we, we started from, right? We helped, when I was director of the Geotech Center, we created the, this D Department of Labor standard. The next thing we did with, under Geotech was we created what we call model courses. In other words, the NSF said, okay, so you help create the standard, that's good, but educators need something more specific. They need syllabuses, they need course outlines, they need recommendations for data, things of that nature. The, the start of the development of what's just typical curriculum that you do in your office or during the summer, right, preparing for your, for your next class. What we did was we took um, the GTCM and we refined it a little bit further with what are called DACOM job analysis. Are you all familiar with that? Okay, DACOM is a standard, Ohio State came up with this, I think back in the 60s, it's called developer curriculum. So for technical career training type uh, colleges and stuff, it's a way to basically interview people that work in that field and extract out of them the knowledge, skills, and abilities, and then organize it into categories and units. But what's interesting is DACOMs have been done for years across many different fields. It wasn't new that geotech did these. Uh, what was unique though is that we took five DACOMs that we created over a period of three years. So basically we bring in 10 to 12 technicians in a field 
no academics were allowed. You could observe if you were a faculty, you could not participate in the actual KSA, uh, led by a trained facilitator, okay, that we had under contract at the center at that time. And they would literally do sticky notes all over the wall, spend two days in it, and bring that, right? And the facilitator would take all that back, put it into a spreadsheet, organize it, sort out what the relevant KSAs are, filter out the ones that were kind of the outliers, right? And then we would verify that against several hundred professionals in the area via a survey, you know, a survey monkey. And so by the time we did this, we had over 900 industry people with over 10 vacums over a period of 10 years. And we did what's called a meta vacuum analysis, where basically it's just a statistical look at all the outcomes from all these different studies and compile them into what we call a, a super meta metadacum, if you will. We took that metadacum, compared it against UPCM, and by the time we did all that, we identified 333 KSAs, soft skills and goals, that every technician in, in the U.S. Should, should know. And from that, we built our, our 10 courses. So the model course utilized a comprehensive consistent building, took 18 months and 40 educators and three national workshops to build. So as we went through this process, we basically came down with a very set, detailed set of uh, skills that these uh, technicians are supposed to know. The curriculum build out, we had a total of five courses by our college that was built over a period of 18 months. The courses are complete learning packages, theory labs, and assessment, so it's all built into the package. Two deeply experienced CIS educators were hired to convert the GTCM model courses and metadictums into the learning modules. So these were people that I knew and trusted. One was actually my son's uh, graduate educator at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi, the gentleman that I've watched come up through the ranks of uh, academia very, very well, a UGA University of Georgia at Athens graduate. Uh, another one was actually a practicing uh, professional. He's a GIS city manager for the uh, city of Sacramento. Materials were then vetted by uh, independent instructional designers at Rio Salado College, which is a member of the NICTC, and then they were reviewed a second time by an independent GIS faculty for completeness and accuracy. So the methodology to develop the curriculum is we started with national standards that were developed by the Geotech Center, right? Started with 12 industry-wide experts, vetted that with these 10 years worth of metadacums, combined that with 40 different educators over three workshops, put all that together, and then hired two of the best people in the country who've been developing GI script to do that. Then once they did the material, then it went to an instructional designer who looked at it for, you know, ADA and 508 compliance and things like that, just verbiage, cleaned that up, and then did it one last time. So all I can say is I think I think we vetted as much as we possibly could uh, all this. These were the two SMEs that we hired. Uh, Dr. Richard Smith works at Texas Center Corpus Christi Survey and Geomatics. And Nate Jennings is a GIS manager for the city of Sacramento. He's also an adjunct faculty at, at the Mer American River College and several others. I think this is actually part of the college system up there in Sacramento. He teaches at several of their, uh, of their campuses. So, our e-learning del delivery options. The materials are available as, creative, as a common course package for download and reuse under Creative Commons 3.0. So the Department of Labor said, when well, we gave this money to hire these guys here, and we paid them close to six figures to get all this done, uh, the material has to be provided. Uh, you can use it in your consortium, but it has to be delivered nationwide, because that's what the DOL wanted on this. Uh, I built a Canvas LMS scoring package available uh, with complete GIS theory and embedded assessments. We also have the raw, raw PowerPoint where documents and images available for repackage and reuse. I have those on a Dropbox that I can share uh, or on GitHub if you want to use that. We also have, and I'll show you this in just a second, interactive modules available in pure flash format for plug and play. So if you want to use this in uh, any LMS, we've got this, uh, the, the flash done in Storyline and basically can just plug it in. It has all the theory and then you can add whatever you want to around that. Oh, that's the material that these SMEs came up with that they gave to the, uh, that they gave to the instructional designers. So the raw PowerPoints and words and graphics that I created, I'll show you how we created the courses. Because different educators want this, some people want a turnkey package, which is what I'm going to try to show you. And that's what we try to sell, right, a turnkey package here. Here's everything you take it and use it. A lot of people, especially educators, especially experienced educators, go, I don't want that. I like what you got, but I want to add my stuff to it or change it. And so we want to make that available to them. All we ask is attribution, <laughs> and you keep the creative common license on there. 
The impact on academic programs, curriculum is now being used at seven colleges in the NICTC consortium in four different states. It's being used, of course, at our college, right? Completely read at our college. Being used at Bunker Hill in Massachusetts, they're a brand new GIS program. Marine Valley, who has a big presence here, the big IT shop, they just started teaching GIS this semester, so next week they, they begin their classes. And so Marine Valley is using it brand new. Bellevue College, uh, again, has a program that they're starting based upon us. We then went out and I put three other colleges under contract, which were not part of the original NICTC. Austin Community College in, in Austin, obviously, Radio Community College, and then Everett Community College. So these two are going to pair up with us at Del Mar. Everett's going to pair up with Bellevue because they're neighbors to share a curriculum and try to build up their programs. And so the point I'm trying to make is this curriculum is being used in whole or part by seven colleges currently, and we hope to, to spread that to uh, the six or 700 colleges that use GIS. Uh, it's interesting, Austin Community College is using just one of the five courses. They have a very advanced GIS program. Matter of fact, uh, Sean Moran there, who's the, the GIS uh, chair of that department, helped us create these model courses way back in, in 2010, 11, and 12. So he knows the curriculum. He created this stuff, right? All they wanted was the cartography course, and that's fine. So they're an example of we just want to pick and choose what we're going to use. Laredo Community Colleges, they had a CAD program, nothing to do with GIS. They want to do GIS. They're taking the whole thing, so it's turnkey. Um, so technology overview. It, the consortium has seven colleges, each with its own, I would call it, independent data center. Consists of Dell servers, Cisco switches, and network, uh, NetLab appliances to deliver remote access curriculum. So the technology looks vaguely like this. If you can imagine a rack of Dell servers with the big power supplies, a SAN disk, the Cisco switches and all that. All this was purchased and spec'd out back in, in 2010, 2011. Uh, Andy Healer from the CTC at the time was uh, is the PI on this NOCTC, so their technical people put it together. And essentially what it does is it allows uh, internet access through routers and switches to you know, local classroom, local network, or remote academy, or even a remote teacher or a remote student coming in through the internet, through the switches, into this appliance to get access to basically our virtualized equipment. Um, so servers are running the VM hypervisor to support both Windows, and we have Windows Linux. You can, of course, support other ones on that. And for us, the application software includes the latest ESRI ArcGIS 10.1 suite. If you know anything about CAD, you know, you're probably familiar with all of CAD 14 point whatever, right? It's really large footprint, really complex stuff to set up and license servers and all that. If you're not a CAD expert, trying to install that and maintain it on the lab, lab is a real pain. ArcGIS, which is the world's leading GIS software, exactly the same thing. Large footprint, very complex, has its own terminology has an independent license server that, you know, if it fails, the software won't load like it did on me this morning. That's what I was going to call So that's why we wanted to virtualize this and try to make it as simple as possible for partners like Laredo Community College who, you know, they don't want to have to, to, to mess with it. Okay, so here's some demonstrations. Let's look at those quickly. Uh, let's see. So we talked about that. Here is, in, how many of you are using Canvas? You might heard of it by Instructure. It's a really cool, it's an open source learning management system. It's cloud hosted. And so what you're seeing here is actually Canvas's free version. So I said that you could get a free account and that, I can give you access to any of these classes if you want to just take a look at them, uh, even though I know most of you are not teaching GIS. But everything we did, all the pictures here and everything are Creative Commons. So part of what the instructional designer did for us was to make sure we didn't violate copyright, right? because we, we are redistributing this uh, for free. And so let me show you what a student view of this course would look like. So this is a 101. We've got five classes. And the modules over here, these were the raw PowerPoints and stuff that I was talking about. So if I take a look at this, I can click on that. And hopefully this will load up here. So the student can go through it just in kind of a linear fashion. You know, you have uh, the typical navigation. You can always go back to the main menu. But all these uh, images and stuff are original. 
So again, we can give you copies of that. And basically, you see the text here. I just took it right out of the narrative and put it right in here. Um, you know, as HTML, it's uh, basically came out of a Word document. And then uh, we go through here. We have embedded in that YouTube videos that are uh, public domain that uh, you can use. And so this whole package, I can compress it and send it to you as a common course cartridge, several ways that, that Canvas will export this. And you can import it into your WebCT, your Blackboard, uh, Moodle. Probably with a bit of work, you could get it into your uh, into your Moodle. But you can see it's just it, it's sort of a, a linear format of, of, the, of the material here. We have built into it. We have built into this thing assessments. So there are quizzes that I've taken several questions out and put them about every five to ten PowerPoints. Um, different ways that you can use this. You could use it as a standalone e-learning option where students can learn remotely, and then you can assess them on their projects or on their uh, exams here. What we do is we, we're basic traditional campus. We teach in the classroom and we do hybrid courses. So we supplement, we, we modified our curriculum. Uh, actually, our whole, whole program it used to take two and a half to three years to get to our, our, uh, our AAS degree. We're now compressing that down to a year because what we've done is taken our 16 week courses and compressed them down to eight weeks. And so it used to be that you take the introduction to GIS, which is the intro course you have to take before you take any of the other ones, right? And because of the timing issues and all that, you schedule it in the fall. Hopefully, you know, they stick around through the winter break and in the spring they can take the 102 and the 103. If that doesn't happen, then you have to have a new section of the 101. So what we've done is we've compressed it to where they're taking just one course for eight weeks, and then when they're done with that, they can take the second course, which opens up all kinds of scheduling options and gets people through the program a lot quicker. Now, we, we can do that because we have certificates and stuff that are pure GIS that we've got. They don't have to go out and deal with the other uh, academic courses, right? And also, we said so that primarily at night and primarily on the weekends so that they can come into class and they can still take the Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday English course they want to. We don't knock them out of that. But they can take our classes back to back and complete basically two classes in one semester. So what would have taken them 32 weeks, they can now do in 16 weeks. And I like it better because they're focusing on one, one topic at a time and completing that. So, yeah, it's a little rush in that you're trying to do in 16 weeks what you used to do in eight weeks, but you're not trying to do two courses at the same time. So to me, it just it makes a lot more sense in the linear fashion. Uh, assignments. And so we have um, assignments built into here. And we, we show them videos like on how to install the ArcGIS software. This video will demonstrate how to acquire, install, and activate your one-year student evaluation edition of ArcGIS desktop. So we do, we do have the option where the software is on the virtualized server, but if they want to use it on their own desktop and stuff, they can get a, a trial copy of that. I'm curious about what technology you're providing remote access to. Is it just a software suite, or in your particular pieces of hardware also you're providing access to? to the for, for GIS, just software. Because what we're, what we're training in our program is kind of entry level. We're training GIS desktop, desktop technicians, essentially. These are people that go out and work for, um, they go out and work for appraisal districts and engineering departments doing essentially desktop GIS. Uh, we do have GPSs built in there, but it's hard to do anything remotely on a GPS. So for those students, we do have a requirement to come to campus if we're going to use GPS in there. In terms of the other curriculums, you may be interested in the system networking and the security. We do provide them access. Actually, in our rack, we have a bunch of Cisco routers that they can get into. I mean, the, the live router through you know the, the Windows or Linux interface. And so they do get access to those machines. Those are in my rack. Since I'm doing the GIS program, we're not even using them. We're just using the software that's installed in it. So for my students, it's just a Windows 7 desktop. I am particularly, for myself, I'm interested in your process of providing access to that suite and perhaps your experience or, or okay. questions in, in setting it up. For instance, we've had our own problems just with the current window licensing yeah. uh, systems in yeah. uh, virtualization and the process of trying to put a complex suite like this on yeah. the uh, um, OS. Rich, Rich Weeks, who's with Network Development Group, which is a contractor that did the net appliance that you'll see here in a second, is at this conference. He's given a talk, I think, this morning. Talk to Rich Weeks. He can, he can really give you the insight to that. 
Essentially for us, it was kind of a no-brainer because part of the NICTC consortium provided us with the technical experts up at Marine Valley, um, you know, John Sands and his group, their people, and they went out and hired people uh, from Dell to actually configure the same. They came down and installed it. They came down and configured it. So all those types of issues. And we still have to install our software and deal with the license server and, and other issues like we've got our, our servers locked down so that they can't get out to the internet once they get into the Windows desktop. They can't get out anywhere. Everything they needed was right there on the desktop. That's okay for our first three courses. When we go into the last two courses, the cartography and the remote sensing, those students literally in the real world need to go out to the internet and download data and visit websites and stuff. They can't do that. So our instructors are a little hesitant to use those two courses in this sort of sandbox environment. But again, we had to do that way because we're teaching network security on this same physical box that's connected to our campus network. And we didn't want our brightest and best hackers to get into our academic and administrative network through this sandbox. So, so that, so that uh, is some of the things. But the long story short is I can tell you a little bit about what it is, but if you really want to hear the horror stories and the solutions, talk to John Sands from Marine, Marine Valley. Uh, John Sands is here giving uh, <clears throat> discussions on this, and it's probably more relevant because most of y'all are security or, or networking. Um, Rich Weeks from Network Development Group is here, and you can meet him tonight, I'm sure, or at lunch and uh, just seek him out. But they can give you the real insight into that. Okay, let me show you. So uh, this is actually out on this thing called My D Lab, which is so this would be, let me go back to which one this would be here. Did you, did you integrate the access to the remote labs into the, the Canvas yeah. for the assignments? We did. It's just a link. Okay. It's just a URL that goes to this one right here. So what you're going to see, what is the screen you're seeing, that web page is being served up by our, our NetApp appliance, which is on this Dell rack. So this, this, this has got the HTTP server that you access to get into uh, in that configuration. So that's what you're seeing right here. The students log into this, and I, I've logged in as a student account, and I, I give that to you on the, if you want to try this, all the information is on the PowerPoint that I'll provide to you later on. Uh, but the nice thing is you can look, uh, let me go back here. We have the curriculum out there, and this is an example of the curriculum that I was talking about. that's in Flash. And so here is the complete theory that's done in this uh, nice, neat, you know, well-defined package. Students can go through. It has quite a bit of interactivity on it right here. So this is the same thing as what you were seeing back here on these modules where, you know, just scrolling page after page after page. So this one I like a little bit better in terms of, as an instructor, if I were to put this out and teach it in a Canvas or a Blackboard or a Moodle. And the nice thing is this stuff is just all plug and play. You just put this right into your web server and off you go. And so if you're trying to build national curriculum for redistribution and adoption by colleges, I think this is the quickest way to do it. Now the problem with this is, is obviously uh, this is fixed. So once it's coded and stuff, you know, you don't make changes to it. So you, you either adopt all of it or you adopt none of it. Of course, you can skip what you don't work, but it's all there. And so we have seven, six to seven modules per class times five classes. So quite, quite a bit of theory out there available for people teaching uh, GIS, right? And so and I've got this for each of these courses. So I can go all the way down to remote system. And look at that. And the layout is essentially the same. Okay. So those are available. The curriculum is available basically in three formats, right? The raw stuff, I'll share it off my Dropbox files. That's not the way DLL lets me share it. Uh, I can give it to you as a SCORM compliant module, which is the way DLL really wanted it done. You know, Common Course Cartridge, SCORM 2.0. Or if you want, I can do a Blackboard or a, a Moodle or a, a Canvas package for you. Okay. 
And then the other thing we do in here is we support the actual um, labs. And so this is the net lab, and this is where this is now I'm kind of help selling his product, right? But students can go in here and they can schedule. So here's the five courses. I can go in there and I can schedule any one of these labs on a virtual server and then come back here and I can, when the time comes, I can enter that lab. So let's try that. So if I click on that enter the lab, I can look at the lab content and here's a 21 page PDF file and again this is repeated out on the Canvas course so it's linked there but also it's linked right here within the, the NetLab server. And so this is the stuff, remember I told you we had a second GIS and start to go through all this? That's what she picked apart was the steps that were missing in this. Uh, if I'm a complete novice and I'm trying to learn this from ground one, so she picked up a lot of stuff that the expert sort of skipped over, which is a good methodology. Make sure you have somebody review it then, right? But it goes through and tells them what they're going to do and then basically shows step by step what they do. And so what they can do is they can just, you know, resize that screen and then they can click on the ArcGIS desktop and actually log into the server. So here's where, you know, this desktop here is remote in and I've got access now. This is a Windows 7 server, correct? And the nice thing about this, all of the data, all of the data and everything they need, notice that we show two, two virtual drives on here. All the data they need for all those courses are, is already out there. So lab by lab by lab, and lab one didn't actually have a hands-on lab. It was a, do a little research paper. That's why it says lab two through lab eight. But you can see all of the data that's necessary to complete these labs is, is embedded on the version. So here, here I've actually gone out and opened up. This is ArcGIS catalog. So this is where I would start to create a blank map or to load data layers. So now we're into the application. So what we provided is we provided a student with the curriculum where they can learn the theory. We provide them with assessments where they can go and reflect on that. Then we provide them with a deep set of labs where they can go out there and they can actually practice all this stuff doing the remote desktop. So that's, that's as about as canned as you can get in terms of trying to create a package for new faculty or new programs that want to adopt GIS technology. Um, I can tell you some of the pros and cons of it. The pros are if you're a brand new school like, school like Laredo and you want to add it to your CAD program or whatever you got, this is a wonderful turning key package. It's been vetted by the, you know, the DOL and it meets all kinds of standards and whatnot. Um, if you want to do something really advanced, there, there, um, there is some issues with having the, in the CAN format. Uh, like I've shown for the cartography class, they really need to be able to go, out and go to the multiple different websites. If I open up a browser inside that Windows 7 remote desktop, it goes nowhere. We just, we just don't allow it. Now, NDG will tell you that we're developing that they develop that, that box is fine to say that's the only way you can get it. We want it locked down. They can configure the routers and switches so that students can go outside. You just have to know that that opens up issues that your administrative IT has to buy off on to be able to do that. So in the next iteration, we're going to have them modify it for those two courses so that we can use it like you use in the real world, which is you can't put today's students in a sandbox. Um, so, so that's the pros and the cons. Um, questions and answers? No. Uh, again, that's sort of a, it's probably more than you want to know about <laughs> how the curriculum was developed. Free accounts, if you want to take a look at any of the GIS curriculum, I can give you an account out on a structure. Um, actually, if you just send me an email, I'll, I'll, and once I capture your email, I can send you a link to do that. Uh, the actual VLAB, you're welcome to go out and look at that. I give you, you know, student account that I was using with a password. So you can actually go out and fire up our, you know, Windows 7 and, and do all that. Now, you brought up an issue about Windows licensing. Maybe that's you. Network Development Group will not touch your product, will not touch your product unless they know that you have licenses for all your software. Anybody you give access to this has to have authority. Like we're, we're right demo use with Laredo Community College and Austin Community College. The only way their students can take our courses on our server and come under our Microsoft and CSR license is they're our students. Well, that's what we did. We literally put them in as our students. Or they buy their own copy, which is what they're doing. 
if you have a dream spark, if you if the school has a dream spark, your IT account be then again. Yeah, you can get the software because what you do is you run it under that, and then Moraine. Right now, Moraine is distributing the licenses. Mm-hmm. Inside of virtualized environment. Yeah, tell me about why touch the server and figure out how to do it. Yeah, and when you're trying to have it in the same box, mm-hmm. it's tricky. And, 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 and the one way around that, you know, we, we run to the same issue. The one way around that is to just tell the student to, you know, ignore it because the class is annoying. Someone is going to say activate or, or leave it or something <coughs> later. Just wait up for that seconds to go up, then, and then it'll be just fine. Yeah. Uh, and I have the same issue when I run Windows 7 as well, you know, and I just kind of let them know that for your own virtual machine, you can install it and put your license in, right? For every 90 days, that was in the semester, so it's like 30 days of annoyance. And, now I just use XP for the yeah. <laughs> 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 One license works for everything. Right. 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 You can do what I'm trying to do. Let's push over that. I'm trying to convince people to go to the local office, go to the Linux, or some version of that, and go to the open EIS. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of hard. Yeah, or maybe, you know, they're still around it because uh, in the real world, you know, overwhelming majority of the users are using Windows. So they have to get to, you know, familiar with that. So, you know, open source is, sounds really attractive once you get to the reality of the world in which the student are exposed to when you get out. And they're going to let go. Well, and that's what they say about the ESRI because it's in 90% of the active programs in the U.S., actually worldwide. And I keep trying to promote open source. People say, well, there's no job just report. Well, yeah, they're all. And it's not, I'm not saying replace Ezra, I'm saying add some of the So it's like a tool thing. So I think our students, like I teach students at some point, you teach them all the Windows stuff you want, they need to have one Linux word. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because as they move up the food chain, you find more and more open source in the back end doing the operating system and exactly what heavy lifting yeah. databases and things like that. Um, and the bread does not some help too, you know, most of our, you know, our brands are of course even even Citrix, Cineware, Microsoft, all those whatever, all these platforms are uh, they they push you guys to suck your back into you know, into Windows. You know, you want to get rid from it. most of the solutions like virtualization and all that kind of stuff, you know, they suck you right back into it, you know. We use Linux as much as we could, you know, and we could get it over here. Yeah, you have to go back and rewind the command. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> By the uh, answer, if we had a little discussion here about server license manager rewind.